it is absolutely my pleasure to introduce um, Brian Dawson to, to, to us today. Brian, thank you so much uh, for being here with us and taking the time. Uh, Brian graduated from CMC with a BA in government in 1989, went and got his MA at the University of Chicago and his JD at Bolt Hall at Berkeley. Since 99, Brian has represented individuals and companies as both plaintiffs and defendants in a wide array of Oregon personal injury, wrongful death, civil rights, patent infringement, employment, and construction defect disputes. He's taken over 100 Oregon cases through trial or arbitration and has experience in discovery, motion, uh, motion practice, and appeals. He's tried cases in most of the circuit courts in Oregon and has twice argued before the Federal Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, Brian has settled hundreds of personal injury claims and lawsuits. In addition to being an alumnus, Brian is also a CMC parent from the class of 2018, resides in Portland, Oregon. Brian, we're very excited for your topic today uh, as we talk, discuss a wrongful death suit in Oregon. Brian, the show's yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Evan, and for Jenna for setting this up. I think that uh, the, the case that I'm here to talk about uh, is interesting in several respects. And one of those is that I actually can talk about it. A lot of cases that I deal with, if they're notable, if they deal with a lot of money, end up with a non-disclosure agreement as part of the release. And so basically you can't talk about those cases. Uh, I represented uh, somebody who was injured in a, a gas explosion, which blew up half a block in Portland a few years ago. And I can only tell you that much about it. I can't go into any of the details or anything that would uh, be important about that case. This case is different. This case involved a claim against a public entity. And I never went into the, the details of how the law works, but clearly part of the law is that they can't have non-disclosure provisions about uh, these kind of settlements. I'm sure they would have loved to, but they didn't. Uh, so I can talk a lot about the evidence that we developed and about some of the factors that we thought about. There's limits on what I can talk about. I want to talk about any of the uh, privileged material or confidential material about the, the case with my client, who is a personal representative uh, of the gentleman who died. Uh, but I can talk to you about some of the medical issues. I have the, the release from the uh, personal representative. So I can talk a lot about this case, which I thought was uh, interesting, both from a, a litigation perspective and also related to some public policies. Uh, how prisoners are treated is a very important issue. The prison population in the United States is massive. Uh, there are 2.3 million Americans in custody at the moment. And if that were a state, it would be uh, 37th, I believe. So it would be less populous than West Virginia. No, Kansas, I'm sorry, and more populous than uh, New Mexico. So it is a big population and providing proper care for them is a very important job. That job is not being done very well. About at the same time that this case was being settled, there was a report from Reuters called Dying Inside that talked about some of the failures in the US uh, prison care uh, system. And so uh, that's worth reading if you want to investigate that side of this topic some more. Uh, the case involved an individual, of course, and so I'm going to uh, share my screen here uh, for the first of several times. And so uh, the individual who died is Michael Barton. That is Michael Barton. The, Photograph on the left was taken by his brother who ended up being the personal representative. So my contact is part of this lawsuit. Uh, so he was on the river rafting in the, the left-hand photograph. He was an inmate in the right-hand photograph. He grew up in a, a family with a lot of dysfunction, a lot of poverty. His brother said when they would go fishing as kids, it was to catch dinner. And if they didn't catch any fish, sometimes they didn't have dinner. Uh, Michael, made it through high school, may have taken a few college classes. Um, I never met Michael, he died a year before I learned that he existed, uh, but his brother describes him as somebody who could be warm and charismatic, uh, but also could be a, a scary person to be around. He had a fairly long uh, criminal career. Uh, we, of course, looked at his 
uh, roster of the criminal convictions that he had that started sometime, I think in his mid twenties, maybe, maybe even in his teens, uh, and ran for about two pages. Uh, some people's run for seven pages. So he, uh, was not as active as some, some of his crimes involved violence. The last crime, the one that he was convicted of before he ended up in the Oregon state prison, I think tells uh, some of the story about who he had become by the time uh, he was going into prison for the last time. Uh, he was homeless or close to homeless at the time, and he was living with some other people, and he said to them uh, that he wanted money to get his medications. So he took a knife and he walked into a bank, I think it was in Ashland, Oregon, and he went up to the teller and clearly made threatening criminal statements. He or the teller gave him a bag of money that probably had a bunch of ink packets in it. And he went walking out fully on camera and uh, then walked out of the building and heard sirens because the police had been tipped off that their bank had just been robbed. And he went up to the first officer who was approaching the bank and said, I'm the one you're looking at for. Um, so he, was diagnosed after that with various mental conditions, including cognitive deficits brought on by substance use. Um, so uh, he ended up that time, I think that conviction was in 2016. He ended up you know, back in prison, which he had been to a few times during his adult life. And he transferred between a few different prisons and ended up at the Oregon State Penitentiary, which is one of the oldest and one of the largest prisons in the state of Oregon. And that's where he died. He died there on February 7th, 2018. Um, and the jail personnel didn't have contact information for him. So they, other than they notified one of his friends who he had listed on one of the forms that Michael Barton had died of a heart attack. I think the friend posted that information on Facebook and that's how his family found out about it. Uh, his family consisted of his brother and older sister and a niece. Uh, so they at first heard that he had died of a heart attack in prison and didn't think more about it than that. But then what happened was that there were a couple of personnel who worked at Oregon State Prison who were very upset about what they had seen happen. And so they got a hold of a group called Disability Rights Oregon. Disability Rights Oregon then prepared a report that was at least 20 pages that talked about uh, all of the problems with Michael Barton's care. And very importantly, that report talked about it, didn't give names, but it talked about the fact that there was uh, one of the, the officers in the prison and at least one inmate, possibly three inmates who had contacted that group and who were directly quoted in there. So it was clear that there was not only a problem related to Mr. Barton's death, but that there were witnesses who could uh, you know, give more information about that who saw it directly and had a lot of details about what had happened. So the story that the family had heard that had been released to the family contacts was that he had died of a, a heart attack, but the story was much more complicated where he had developed first the flu, then pneumonia, then sepsis, septic shock, organ failure, including heart attack. And so the heart attack was part of it, but only one part of what led to his death. So I was contacted by his brother at about the same time that the Disability Rights Oregon report came out. And the timing of all this is very important because uh, in Oregon, you usually have just a year to notify a public entity that you're going to make a claim like this. And I was contacted more than a year after Mr. Barton's death uh, because the family didn't know that there was anything that could amount to a legal claim arising out of this until afterwards. And so that was a, a big factor in our discussion with the government where the government kept saying, you, you did this too late, you took more than a year. And we kept pointing out that actually the case law would show that we have a year from the time of the discovery of the issue leading to the legal claim. So we basically gave instant notice to the state, but that was definitely a factor as this was playing out. So uh, we ended up providing the public notice and then we prepared a federal uh, or a claim that ended up in, in federal court. Uh, so I'll show you that document next. Uh, so this was the page one of about a 30 page complaint that we ended up filing 
so as you can see here, uh, it's a second amended complaint. And uh, I'll talk to you about, uh, I, I show this as an exhibit because it has a few things that I think are, are interesting both to lawyers among, I'm sure that uh, some among the audience are lawyers, uh, but also I think it has some general interest to it. Uh, it ended up in federal court where we did not want it to end up. Uh, and my experience, and I think it's a common experience among lawyers is that when there's a lawsuit that will end up with motions for summary judgment that you're far better off in state court. Um, one of the most frustrating experiences of my career on another case was uh, arguing before the Ninth Circuit and arguing evidence with the Ninth Circuit where I was saying, okay, evidence backs up this claim in this way and citing to the evidence. And they were saying, well, this other evidence contradicts that or doesn't support that. And it was so frustrating because you learn in the first few months of law school that weighing evidence is not part of the summary judgment process, yet there I was arguing basically this, the merits of the case with the panel. So I didn't want to repeat that, and I knew that that was a common experience among a lot of litigators in cases like this. Uh, but what happened is we filed it in state court then the Department of Justice removed it to federal court. And so that's where we ended up in US District Court. Uh, the claims that we made are down in this area. And so we made negligence claims, negligence per se. And that just means that the medical providers who treated Mr. Barton have to use reasonable care under the circumstances. Those are common claims. Then the really, to me, fascinating law that we based the claim on was violation of civil rights, 42 USC 1983. Uh, and I'll talk to you in a lot of detail about that because I think the statute is very interesting and we're an academic institution. So I thought it had a lot of history behind it and was just uh, something that made an interesting part of this lawsuit. Uh, and then wrongful death, uh, disability discrimination. He was diagnosed with various mental conditions. And so the Americans with Disability Act, uh, we believe applied to it and then spoliation. So I'll get back to that. It's kind of a detail of the case, but it relates to the videotape uh, that is mentioned in some of the documents of some of these incidents that were involved in the lawsuit, but then magically disappeared when we wanted to see what the videotape showed. And I made the point to the attorneys for the state that if an inmate assaults a guard, no doubt there's videotape from five different angles of it, but when the shoe was on the other foot, Suddenly there's not videotape, you know, they didn't produce one second of videotape related to all these things that stretched over a month. Um, so that was how the spoliation claim came up. Another interesting thing about the uh, page one of this 30 page lawsuit is, you know, those are all the defendants over on this side. I don't know if you can see where my cursor is, but I counted them and we ended up suing 27 individuals, uh, mainly RNs, a couple of MDs. Uh, for the care, and normally you wouldn't do that, but we had to under the uh, the 42 USC, the civil rights claim, and that just is how that statute works, where normally what happens if you're suing a large entity is you sue the state of Oregon, or you sue Chevron Oil, or whatever it is, and then they're responsible for what their employees do in the course and scope of their work. The the, the civil rights claim doesn't work that way where you have to sue the individuals. And that gets to be very tricky to do because you often don't know who the individuals are until you're going through the discovery process in the lawsuit. You're, when you're starting to prepare your original complaint, you're often going off of documents where in this case, for instance, we had uh, people's initials. Uh, we had people's handwriting where you couldn't read their handwriting, you couldn't read their name as far as who was responsible for the, the poor care that Mr. Barton received. And so uh, that was one thing about how the statute works that made this uh, tricky. And that's why we kept amending the complaint and kept adding individual defendants because at first we were just basing things off of somebody's squiggled initials. And we would get that wrong sometimes where it was a wrong person when we compare it back and forth with the timesheets. And then as we took depositions, we found out who the people really were who were involved in a lot of the treatment. So if we had keep, kept going in this case, if it hadn't settled fairly early on, 
uh, we may have ended up with 50 defendants. Because if you leave somebody out, especially somebody who's vital, who provided poor care or ignored him at the wrong time, uh, then that's a huge gap in your case if you're going to trial and you wouldn't be able to talk about that part because he hadn't made the claim under the civil rights statute. And that's also why we made a bunch of claims, not just the civil rights claim, because you still probably could at trial then talk about those issues, but we wanted to be careful and make sure we got uh, everybody in who should be in as a defendant. And that's why that list is so long. Um, then the uh, next thing that I wanted to talk about is I wanted to circle back about the uh, statute because I found it uh, interesting, not during the lawsuit so much. Clearly, it was a key part of our lawsuit, but I, I noticed something about this statute. So the, the 42 USC 1983 civil rights claim that we based a lot of our claim on is the same language as you see on your screen now, which you don't have to read, you can't read, it's physically impossible. But I thought the history of it was very fascinating where it was part of the Enforcement Act of April 1871. Uh, and it also is known as the Ku Klux Klan Act. Uh, and so it's part of a bunch of statutes that were passed by the, the radical Republicans after the Civil War and it's called the Enforcement Act because it's enforcing the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment that were passed around that same time. And it's enforcing those, those provisions of the Constitution, which when you think about it, you know, how, how do the provisions of the Constitution come to play to protect citizens? Um, and so, for instance, the Fifth Amendment kind of self-enforces where I've had several depositions where I have a client who uh, has to, is called to testify about something that might be part of a pending criminal matter. And so there the person is asked a question that calls for potential self-incrimination. And instead of answering, they get to say, I'm claiming my Fifth Amendment right against testifying against myself. So that, well, that one's easy. Or for the First Amendment, if you're in jail because you've criticized the government, the government has to bring charges against you and your attorney or you yourself raises an issue, you have a First Amendment protection. But for the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, they weren't going to self-enforce, where if you were denied your right back in you know, 1875 to be able to vote, there's not a clear way that you can enforce that right. And so these statutes were passed in, in part to enforce the, those amendments. Um, and I, I think that that had something to do, just, you know, just how they, they played out had something to do with the, the fact that you have to sue individuals instead of the entities, but I didn't go into that. That's uh, really in depth and I just, I didn't have time uh, to do that. But I thought that the, the statute itself was very important. And, and basically what it says is, that if your constitutional rights are violated, that you have the right to sue the, the individual and through them, the entity uh, that denied your right. So if you're denied your right to vote, you have the right to sue the, the individual. Uh, this is probably the most important civil rights uh, statute in US history. And it is still very much alive. It obviously was the basis of part of our claim. And I saw that, uh, for instance, in the NAACP versus uh, former President Trump uh, that now is pending in uh, you know, one of the, the federal courts back east, this is the statute that's being used for that. Um, so it's, it's a vitally important statute. Uh, and another interesting part of its history, I thought, was that uh, it basically was through the federal court. So it uh, was passed in 1871. And then it and other uh, provisions, including those constitutional amendments, uh, was given very little force by the federal courts, by the Supreme Court and a series of rulings and by federal courts for about 80 years after it was passed. And then it finally came back. Uh, one final thing that I found to be very interesting about the history of this, again, I'll get back to the lawsuit soon, was that this was provision one of the Enforcement Act of April of 1871. Uh, provision three of this same act authorized, like I said, it was the Ku Klux Klan Act was how it also was called. Uh, so provision three authorized the president to uh, 
with the army go combat the Ku Klux Klan, which was very active in the South, especially in South Carolina. At the time this was passed, the president was Ulysses S. Grant and the head of the army was William Tecumseh Sherman. So the same people who were in charge of the North uh, and its army at the time of the Civil War now were authorized to go back into the, the same areas to uh, combat the Ku Klux Klan at that time. So that was something else that I, I found to be very interesting. Uh, so as this all played out uh, in the litigation, um, you know, we made all these claims and then we, we got documents uh, both through the litigation process and also through the, uh, we made a, a, a public uh, records request. And so we got documents that way. And so many of those related to the, uh, the, the, the documents from the prison uh, and also the, the records for our client. We didn't have access to his medical records until we made those kind of uh, requests and it ended up being very important of, of finding out what the details were of how the treatment occurred and the timing. And so uh, one of the important factors was that uh, Michael Barton died on February 7, 2018. Uh, he appears to have come down with the flu sometime in mid-January 2018. So he had it for about three weeks or so. Um, and uh, the, the detail of the care was very important because people die of the flu all the time. Around 50,000 people in the country die of the flu every year. And so what makes him different? Uh, why was there potentially a legal claim about that? And that all arose in the details of his medical records. Um, and so you know some of the important factors uh, for that were uh, in the chart notes. So these were notes that were taken by the, the medical personnel in the prison. So one of the important episodes happened on January 31st, 2018. Uh, so these are Mr. Barton's chart notes that, the, at least in theory, and how it would work in most hospitals would be that the, the nurses or whoever's providing the care would have the records and they would be able to see his history from before and so see the beginning of the flu, see how it was developing, uh, see how he was responding to different treatment and then they would provide their note afterwards for each one of their visits. Uh, one of the key things that came up in this case was that wasn't being done. We had during depositions several of the nurses said that they did not look at the chart notes before and there was a not a good system at the prison for them even to have access to the chart notes so that was one important factor. Uh, but if you look at some of these chart notes, uh, you can see that uh, at, if you can see the time over here, I'm not sure if you're able to follow my cursor, but at uh, 4.30 in the morning on January 31st, 2018, uh, he called in and was taken up to the infirmary and uh, he had been coughing up sputum. He had other issues. And so he went up and uh, was asking to be admitted to the infirmary so that instead of being returned to his jail cell, he would be there for observation and treatment in the on-site facility. Uh, so it says both in the green part there on that page and then down below in the last line that he was uh, very uh, insistent on wanting to be in the infirmary, and he, but he was sent back to his cell at that point. But a, an appointment was set up for him to see a uh, nurse practitioner later that day. But then you see the, uh, I'll deal with these in order because I don't wanna go back and forth among the documents. You see the why not admitted there. And so that's uh, some of the evidence and I'll, I'll show you some more of it, but there, there was uh, definitely uh, criticism of the care afterwards. So Mr. Barton died and that's where the administrator started to look at the kind of care that he received and so the why not admitted, it was written by one of the supervisors questioning the decision of where somebody has these symptoms, the vital signs you can see over to the left-hand side, why was he returned to his jail cell instead of admitted to the infirmary that he was insisting that he wanted to go to. Uh, then if you look farther down this page, he was um, 
in a wheelchair pushed up by uh, one of the other inmates. If you meet certain criteria, then you're able to uh, perform work outside of the prison or help inside the prison. So there was another prisoner who was helping out in this case. And so he went that same day. So it was still January 31st, 2018 and saw a nurse practitioner. So the second visit of that day, um, and again, he was asking to be admitted into the infirmary. He was not, he was sent away. He was prescribed uh, doxycycline for the condition that he had at that time. And the condition by that point was uh, low bar pneumonia. And so he was diagnosed with pneumonia, given his medication, sent back to his cell. But you know, none of this amounts to the kind of case that this ended up being just based on these records. It really is the, the individuals involved that make a difference. And so one of the things that made a big difference in this case in our discovery was that uh, he was pushed in a wheelchair up and we had the inmate who had pushed him up for that session uh, where we had been able to talk to that inmate. And he was one of the people who was likely an informant to Disability Rights Oregon. So he saw what happened. And so when we took the deposition of the nurse practitioner, the, the account was that the nurse practitioner told him, you know, take this medicine. You don't need to be admitted into the infirmary. And she said during her testimony and deposition, and he just said, okay, I, you know, I accept that. But the inmate who pushed him up said, first of all, contradicted a lot of the statements about how uh, Mr. Barton appeared when he went up, but most importantly said he did not accept that. He, he was weeping copiously. Uh, he was distraught when he was not admitted. He felt like he was getting uh, very poor care and that he was turned away. So that, that really is part of the dynamic that happened over and over again in the suit, but this was one of the clear points of it, uh, where there was a uh, effort to deflect any blame um, and to form kind of a, a, a team effort to say, this was just another pneumonia case. Um, there's nothing notable about it. There's no justified legal claim. And it was only by having uh, for instance, that inmate uh, give us what really had happened from what he saw and also having a security guard do the same thing that really made the case different and, and much more uh, meritorious and powerful than it otherwise it would have been. Uh, so just following up and finishing off kind of on this slice of, of the medical care and of the records. Uh, so on the 31st, he was diagnosed with pneumonia uh, and then there are a couple days where there's no chart notes at all. And so uh, there was differing accounts about, well, some people said maybe he was seen, just nobody bothered to prepare chart notes. And that doesn't meet the medical standard of care in itself. Uh, or the, the alternative is he wasn't seen by anybody. He was diagnosed with pneumonia and then just not seen for two straight days. But then when he was seen, so these records start up on, you know, a few days afterwards. So on February 2nd, 2018, uh, there's three providers in a row who say that he refused his medications. Uh, so by that point, he has uh, a diagnosis of pneumonia. Uh, he has all these symptoms that we went into detail with all of the witnesses about how, how bad he was doing. Uh, yet the account was by three separate people that he was refusing medications. So there's one on February 2nd um, that he refused. And then on February 4th, again, he refused. And then on February 5th, again, he refused his medications. There was no history of him refusing anything at any time in the past. Um, but they were saying that he was refusing his medications at that point. And then you can see down here on February 6th that it was man down. So that was where he had the heart attack. He was rushed off to the hospital uh, and he died on the 6th, so the next day. Uh, so, you know, that I think nobody was believing that he was refusing his medications. Instead, the standard practice was that you either would go out for, it was called Medline, and you would go to a card and you would get your medications there. Or if you 
didn't want to do that, couldn't do that, that you would stand at your door and the provider would come by and give you your medications at your door. But he wasn't doing either of those. And so they interpreted that as him refusing it, but they didn't bother to look in his cell. And these are open cells and see that he was laying there in the bed. They didn't look at his chart notes, so they didn't know that he had pneumonia. Um, so that was, uh, you know, one of the things that made clear to us that his treatment was was very bad. And this is, you can see the question mark, unable question mark. Uh, so even the people looking into it from the prison were wondering about people interpreting somebody in that medical state being unable or refusing to uh, take his medications. And then we never did bring this up in, in depositions because the case settled about two or three witnesses before we got to the person who had prepared this record. But these are records that show when somebody is taking their medication. And so I made very clear with numerous different witnesses that you only write your initials on this form when you have watched the person receive their medication and take the medication in front of you. And so every initial on this form means that the person took their medication, the nurse watched it, and the nurse filled out this form. This form can't be accurate because the same people who said that he was refusing his medication, you know, if you look down on that last, last entry, that's uh, his doxycycline for the, the influenza and for the pneumonia. And on the same dates when they're filling out that he had taken his medication, they're also preparing chart notes that he was refusing his medication. And so I think that the defense counsel realized that uh, they had all kinds of problems, uh, not just along the lines of making it, you know, a, a mistake, which any of us can make in our professional lives, but also, uh, you know, real problems with the, how the documents showed that there was, uh, you know, just poor treatment and, and just dishonesty and how a lot of this was dealt with. You know, and just to, to show you some of the, I, I talked before about how uh, there was uh, an issue about initials and handwriting and all that and having to base our legal claims on that. This is an example of that where we had to find out, you know, what those initials mean as they related to the official documents and base our claims on that. Uh, so that's why it's a very rough start, at least until you start taking depositions to name the right people under the civil rights claims. Uh, we also had outside help beyond just the uh, the inmates and the uh, the prison guard, uh, but they were really critical and they were very brave in in coming forward. So I don't want to discount them at all, especially the the prison guard, uh, where that's you know her job is at stake and all that. But she just cared enough where she took those risks, and she was there during. The, the last night of Michael Barton's uh, life before the man down was called in. And she basically said, I said that he needs help. He's not going to make it. And that she notified other people and they said, he has an appointment tomorrow, stop bothering us. Um, so her coming forward was, was one really critical part in kind of breaking through the, the wall that they were trying to build about this just being another flu death. But then also the, the medical records from the hospital made a big difference. Um, so he was taken from, from the state penitentiary to Salem Hospital. And it was, he was diagnosed as looking malnourished when he was brought in at that point. Uh, but it became very clear how far they at the prison had let his pneumonia develop where I'll come back to these ones. But uh, during the uh, deposition of one of the providers, um, I asked her, uh, you know, how do you know how much, you diagnosed him with pneumonia, how do you know how advanced the pneumonia was? And pneumonia can be anything from something that's, that's relatively minor and needs little care up to being something that leads to death as in this case. And so uh, I had her fill out uh, this form you can see here was deposition exhibit 67. And so this area here that she wrote on, she just said, you know, there's just a little, she could hear it with her stethoscope and there was just a little tiny quadrant of one of his lungs that had uh, the infection in it that was what she diagnosed as low, low bar pneumonia. Uh, and I asked her, 
you know, what could you do besides listening to his lung with a stethoscope to assess that, to see how advanced it really was? And the answer was she could have used the x-ray. There was an x-ray technician just through the other side of the wall that she examined him in. Uh, it, you know, it's free. It, it is a machine that belongs to the prison. So all that, all it would have taken would be to use that x-ray, uh, but she elected not to do it. Um, and by the time that he was treated at the uh, hospital, this is sideways, of course, but, uh, you know, this was the condition of his lung. So that is what a complete whiteout looks like. Uh, one of the first surgical, you know, the, the dark part down here at the bottom is what both sides are supposed to look like. But the top part is uh, a gallon of pus uh, that was in his left lung. Um, and so this was a case where the, the pus and the infection had developed to the point where one lung was pressing against the other, was pressing against the organs in the middle of the, the thorax, uh, where that's why he was refusing medications was because he was physically unable basically to breathe at that point. Uh, so the radiology report, uh, you know, showed that he had a large volume of pleural material in his lung. Uh, so this was taken the day he was admitted to the hospital and that it was pushing against his, uh, his other lung, preventing him from breathing. Uh, so to go back to this, this was another hand-drawn diagram, obviously, that was prepared by one of the providers. And we knew because we had talked to the inmate who had pushed Michael Barton's wheelchair up that day, but they didn't know that we knew about that person. Uh, that's why this ended up being very important is that I, I had the provider uh, draw a diagram of how the room was set up. She said that there weren't you know, full walls, there wasn't a closed door, it was just half walls. And then the helper, I think she ended up saying that he was actually right there next to where the exam happened. She started off with him being you know, 10 feet away and then she said, no, he probably was right outside. Uh, but that was critical because we knew what he was going to say. And so if, if we went there and they actually had an enclosed examination room and she said the door was closed, then we would tend to discount what the inmate was saying, but where uh, he was right there and she drew the diagram indicating that he probably was there, she wasn't paying any real attention to him, uh, then his account of Michael Barton being in very horrible physical shape and uh, him overhearing all this because he was right there and it was a wide open examination area uh, has a lot more credibility and carried a lot more weight. Uh, the uh, getting his and the, well, especially his uh, affidavit, which we ended up getting was a nightmare because of COVID where normally the first thing I wanted to do was physically go to the prison, look around, take photos, have a photographer come with me and document all this. None of that was possible. I, I've still to this day never been inside Oregon State Prison, um, even though I asked 20 times over the course of a long period of time, uh, just because COVID was restricted. And then communicating with, uh, for instance, this inmate also was very hard to do, um, but we ended up doing it um, and then ended up getting an affidavit and gave that to the other side, clearly contradicting with a lot of information that was very powerful, the account that several of the witnesses uh, had come forward with. So uh, that was really the main factor that led to the case resolving the way that it did. Um, so I know we we're supposed to have question time. I think there were a couple, oh, there was, you know, another part of the dynamic of this case was that there ended up being a lot of uh, finger pointing within the Oregon State Prison. So for instance, uh, as part of the investigation afterwards uh, and how poorly the investigation was done and how, you know, how many holes it left open was part of what really upset the guard. And that's why she came forward to Disability Rights Oregon. But even to the extent they did look into it, you can see in the green part there that some of the medical providers were saying that they were not allowed to enter the cell to provide treatment. And that's why uh, it was inadequate. And so we brought that up with several of the prison guards and the prison guard said, that is just false. Um, you know, they were allowed into the cell anytime they wanted to provide treatment. 
Um, so that's just them trying to blame us for their own mistakes. And there was that kind of issue going back and forth a lot of the time. And then kind of from a public policy side of this case, another thing that was very interesting is I've talked about how Disability Rights Oregon um, really brought this into the open where it was just everybody thought just a heart attack case and then they published their report. Uh, what ended up happening, so this is still back before I was involved at all. So it was back in July 18 of 2018, the uh, office of the director and the director herself ended up signing this, basically uh, threatened Disability Rights Oregon, where Disability Rights Oregon sent a draft of their report to the Department of Corrections. And then the uh, director of the Oregon prisons, who's very high up in the administration, uh, said she was surprised and disappointed at their approach. Uh, and she thought it was had factual inaccuracies and omissions. And how it ended up playing out is that it, it had omissions because Disability Rights Oregon doesn't have the right to discovery like lawyers do, but the omissions were in the wrong direction as far as it, the prison was concerned, where there was a lot more that you know, was damning that we discovered than was in that original report. And so uh, what she wanted to do at that point was basically to call in the investigator who authored the report and the director of Disability Rights Oregon and uh, you know, talk to them. Uh, so uh, that was uh, one thing that I thought was notable about this case. Uh, and then when this case settled, this is uh, the article that appeared in the front page of the Oregonian. And that's the same person uh, who wrote that letter, uh, indirectly at least, making, in my opinion, threats against uh, the working relationship they had with Disability Rights Oregon, uh, apologizing. So uh, Corrections Director Colette Peters uh, here is apologizing for what happened with Mr. Barton and saying this should never happen again um, if she had taken that same approach from day one instead of trying to suppress the Disability Rights Oregon report, um, I, I think that her apologies after it's all been exposed uh, would, would carry a lot more weight. Um, and what happened just briefly in the, in the settlement is that, uh, you know, we received early on uh, from the, the very pleasant, honest attorneys from the Department of uh, Justice in Oregon, um, you know, some indications that they wanted to settle the case, but they, they had in mind a certain, you know, very low amount and just wanted to treat it as somewhat of a nuisance. And then we kept developing more and more evidence. And I think that all became very clear to them that they had an undefensible case. Um, and so we, through a mediation, ended up uh, working out a settlement. Uh, and our concern the whole time was to survive summary judgment uh, where you need to develop evidence to support all of your claims. And that was not a serious concern of ours by the time we were finished with even 10 of the depositions, we ended up taking 20 depositions or so and probably needed another 10 before we were done with discovery. Uh, but clearly the mediator was able to get through to people very high and the government in Oregon saying they had a real problem with this case. And so uh, they were very proactive at that point in settling it, settled at a, a mediation. So that's what I had to say for my part of the monologue, and then I'd be happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Brian. Um, fascinating story, um, terrifying, of course, as well. I have a number of questions that have come in um, via private chat or via email. I do encourage you to put any questions in the chat, and we will uh, we will work to get those uh, in over the next ten minutes. Uh, you can also virtually raise your hand if you hit the reactions button at the bottom. Uh, go ahead and uh, raise your hand. You can ask your question directly to Brian. So first question I had came in a couple of days ago. Uh, curious about why the, the victim's death was was valued at 2.7 million. It was apparently the, the highest that's ever, um, so it's a record high. Traditional factors, this person said, in evaluating a wrongful death would suggest a lower lower value. Yes, that's true. And, and I'll just be very specific. None of this is protected. Uh, when I was, uh, you know, a lot of this is protected on other issues, but as far as my discussions with opposing counsel, um, they said at some point when 
they began to appreciate that this was a very serious case, uh, that they had been doing this for years and that uh, they had resolved dozens or hundreds of cases and the range was always between 80,000 and I think he said 350 or $400,000 for all these, these claims. And I, I think what really made this one different was uh, first of all, just uh, just the, the, the visual of the, the x-ray of the lung um, was one huge factor. And it's very true that a, a picture says a thousand words. And so, um, you know, I don't think you can appreciate it today during this speech, but it really just does look like something that should never happen to anybody to have a lung that has, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, buildup of infection in it, where we had various medical experts on our side too. And they said that that was something that built up over a long time. So that was one factor. Another factor was that there was a lot of duplicity. And so it wasn't just a situation where, um, you know, people made mistakes, people forgot to check on a guy for one night or something like that. Uh, but when you get into the fact of, uh, you know, there are reports where they, uh, you know, the, the medical one or the medicine one was really the big one where they signed off on him taking a medication and then heavily relied on that document saying, look, he always took his medication and they hadn't read over their own documents, I don't think, but I think their lawyers did eventually and realized, wait, uh, he couldn't have been given his medication. Either he was or he wasn't. So one of these two documents is just flat out false. Um, and then I, I think that the, the director of corrections also came into it where we were pressing to take her deposition and saying, were you really thinking of threatening this group that wanted to expose what happened that you're admitting is a horrible situation? Um, so I think they did not want that deposition to take place. And I think that was another role that played into this having a very high value. Thank you. Um, we had a question about if there was any retaliation against the medical staff at the prison or any of the staff at the prison who, um, who allowed this to happen? Did anyone lose their license or lose their job? Not that I know of. And that was one thing that was uh, very uh, hard to tell in this case, where one of the depositions we took was of uh, probably the most senior person we talked to. So it wasn't the Department of Corrections who we wanted to depose, but it was one step down from her. And that witness uh, said, oh, this, this changed the way we do everything. And now, you know, people uh, who are providing care have access to chart notes and, you know, we want to get electronic chart notes so that can happen automatically. So and I think that was going to be the main line of defense if this had gone to trial is, you know, this is, this is a bad situation. We learned our lesson. You don't have to teach us another lesson. We already learned it. Uh, but I took the deposition of the chief medical director for the Oregon State Prison System. And I asked him, have you seen any changes from this? And he said, I'm not aware of any. Uh, and, the, and the people in the uh, prison, the inmate said there haven't been any changes. And so I'm not very uh, convinced that anything was done. And I'm not aware of anybody who lost their license or anything like that either. Uh, someone would like your opinion, Brian, uh, on the privatization of prisons and how the treatment of inmates you feel is different from private versus state run prisons. In this example, would a private prison perhaps have been run better than a uh, public prison? Yeah, and I'm not sure. And there was a, another settlement in Oregon that would dwarfs ours. So ours settled for a total of $3 million. There was a $10 million settlement. And that was against a, a private prison system, the biggest prison operator. Um, so I, I don't think that there really is a difference um, in the kind of care that's provided privately versus publicly. Um, you know, one thing that I heard from our experts and we had, I think three medical experts who were involved and even some of the people who we deposed who worked at the prison uh, indicated that they just have lower expectations uh, in prisons across the board. And so, you know, that's really the key part of this is uh, this would never happen in a private hospital, or if it did, you know, where somebody's diagnosed with pneumonia and from the evidence, nobody saw the person for 48 hours afterwards. Um, you know, that's in, from my experience, unthinkable in, in a hospital, but the, the, 
differences in private versus public prison. I think it's prison versus other levels of care or other areas of care where it just seemed like it's what's expected in these places. Uh, this was, according to the director of corrections, the worst she had seen. Um, so I'm not saying that this same thing happens weekly in the prisons, but I don't think it would be much better if it was operated privately. Brian, did you have any interest in this topic before? I mean, you've done some wrongful death uh, cases, uh, but um, I don't think you had done anything with prisons. Are you a little more interested in, in diving into the prison world, or is this just um, another case that you're that you've worked on, and you will work cases as they come as they come to you? Um, I, I had an interest in it before, but I had never done one involving a prison case. And I was intimidated by it because it involved making civil rights claims, which I had never done before. Um, and fortunately, the Ninth Circuit uh, published a guide that gives you basically the, the roadmap to the law that applied, starting with uh, 42 USC 1983 and some of the cases interpreting that. But it was way outside of what I had specialized in. Uh, by getting uh, a lead article in the Oregonian, the Salem newspaper, on down throughout the state, we've gotten dozens and dozens of cases afterwards, and these are just tough cases. Um, so uh, I, I definitely will take the right one, um, and I, I think that you're providing special help when you're helping an inmate who, uh, you know, is not free to choose where they're being treated. Um, so I definitely have an interest in, in helping in this area, but um, from all the contacts we've had, it, it, it definitely is something that you have to scrutinize carefully as a lawyer, deciding if you want to put the resources into these kind of claims. And last question before we conclude, Brian, uh, do you feel that we're going to see more cases like this related to COVID and treatment of COVID in uh, inmates with COVID in hospitals? Where do you think that's going to go? I don't uh, personally, I think that uh, COVID is such a, a, it's affecting everybody everywhere. And I think that uh, people realize that prisons have special uh, challenges in dealing with, with COVID. So I don't think that there are gonna be a lot of COVID related claims. And my hesitancy in taking this case in the first place was, uh, my understanding was that Mr. Barton had died of, of flu. And like I said, 50,000 people do you know, what sets that apart? Uh, how many people, 500,000 have died of COVID? What makes that into something that justifies a legal claim? And so you have to find something really different uh, from just a, a, a general uh, problem. And that, that was pretty clear to me from early on in this case that those kind of separate factors existed. But I don't think that you're gonna find them as much in COVID. I know that there's been a lot of litigation about, uh, you know, dealing with COVID kind of on the, directing the prisons of how they have to provide care in certain situations. But I don't think this kind of personal injury wrongful death claim is going to be very common with uh, COVID issues. All right, Brian, thank you so much for your time. And thanks to all of you for spending an hour with us on this Wednesday afternoon. Hope you have a wonderful evening. We hope to see you at uh, our future programs. Feel free to unmute, say hello, say goodbye, say thank you. Uh, remember that you can visit our alumni and parents section of the CMC website to view our past programs. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.